Pastor Roy Baker here. I'm in my living room. We are doing our Christmas uh, Gifts of Christmas series. And we are be, we're going to look at the gift of love this morning. And uh, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2. And this is one of those uh, interesting topics that I thought would be good to help us understand it by comparing and contrasting it against what it isn't. So what I'd like to do when we answer the question, what is love, is to compare and contrast King Herod with King Jesus. We're going to look at the King of the Jews this morning and compare and contrast their uh, what they would consider perhaps love to be. And sometimes that's helpful to understand something. Sometimes it's better, to, easier to understand light when we compare it against darkness and the contrast helps bring things to the surface. And that's what we're going to do this morning. Uh, we're going to look at three things uh, that relates to love. We're going to look at the direction of it, the motivation of it, and the display of it. So the direction of our devotion, and we'll look at King Herod's direction and his devotion, the motivation of his actions, and the displays of his affections. And we're going to look at Jesus's uh, direction, motivation, and displays as well and compare the two. So we're going to look at Matthew chapter 2. And go through the Christmas story, picking up in verse 1. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, of, uh, Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. First of all, Rome was in control uh, politically, and Julius Caesar had given Herod the title of procreator, uh, of Judea, and the title, the Senate had given him the title King of the Jews. So here you've got these wise men show up and ask where they could find the King of the Jews. Uh, verse 3, And when Herod the king heard th uh, this, he was troubled, and all of Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and scribes and the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it was written by the prophet, uh, I think it's Micah that says this, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, and from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. So then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared, and he sent them... To Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. And after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. And then opening their treasure, they offered to him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. First of all, it's interesting. Just a clarification on the Christmas story. A lot of people have the wise men showing up at the manger, but that is uh, mixing up Luke's and Matthew's. Uh, the story of the wise men appear at the house. It's interesting. Most nativity scenes, you can see we have a little nativity scene over here. We've got our wise men. Most of the time, it's wise men's a part of our nativity scene, so we put it at the manger. But uh, clearly, the, the Bible says that they showed up at their house. So this was later, which is why Herod gets upset and has children who are two and under killed. When I was a kid, I used to sit, or when I was a teenager, I used to take our wise men from our nativity scene and set it across the room to be more historically accurate. But uh, here, God warns the wise men not to go back to tell Herod that Herod had been lying, that he had other motives, other intentions on worshiping the, uh, this child. And in verse 16 said, uh, When Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all the region where there were two, where they were two years old and under, according to the time, that he had ascertained from the wise men. 
And then there's the fulfillment of Jeremiah. So it's interesting. These wise men were there to worship this baby. The baby hadn't done anything, and Herod had done so many things in Jerusalem for the Jews as well as the Romans uh, to build up a name for himself. He's known as Herod the Great. This baby had not done anything, and these wise men came in and thought this baby was worth giving all these gifts to. Why is that? We're going to talk about that a little bit this morning. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is the direction of Herod's uh, affections. So his devotion, his uh, direction of his devotion. So for Herod, the direction of his devotion was completely towards himself. Uh, this is something that whenever an earthly love becomes something uh, divine in our heart, it, it distorts or becomes perverse. Um, there's a, a book, I think it's The Four Loves. William O'Flaherty would correct me because the C.S. Lewis book, and, and, and in that book, um, it kind of talks about the difference between uh, God being love and love being a God. So, for example, kind of the subtle distortion is, is that when we make, when we recognize that God is love, we recognize that it's an attribute of God, the essence of who God is, um, and it is a beautiful thing. It's a part of God's character. And yet, when we take an element of God's character and we abuse it or manipulate it, we can make that thing an idol. Uh, Lewis said in that book, love, having become a god, becomes a demon. What does that mean? Uh, this happens in Herod's life. Because his love was so inward focused for himself, he cared about himself so much that he wanted this title, king of the Jews. So what does Herod do? He marries into the Hasmonean family because he wants to solidify uh, that he's the king of the Jews. So this, this royal priesthood family. But then he does not want that threatened. So he begins to have members of the Hasmonean family killed off. He divorces his, his first wife because, you know, he loves himself. And when you're not happy anymore, you just get rid of the thing that poses a threat to your happiness and you get someone new. So he married this girl that he originally loved. He ended up having her killed. Uh, she was part of the Hasmonean family and then had their uh, two of their sons drown. I mean, just a, a sick uh, person who killed off all these people because the thing he cared most about was his own title, his own position. It was so inward focused that anything that posed a threat, uh, he tried to eliminate it. Now, it's interesting because anytime, we're, we're all the same way, the thing that we cherish most, anything that poses a threat to it, we'll try to eliminate it. And because Herod was always the person he loved most, he was continually trying to eliminate threats to anything that would be against him. That's why he was so adamant to get rid of this Christ child. Uh, Jesus, for him, was a threat to eliminate. And it poses a question for us to consider this morning as we think about the Christmas season, when does Jesus become a threat to us? And typically, uh, when we care about ourselves more than we care about God, uh, this could happen. And, and ironically, we're more tempted, I think, around Christmas time to care for ourselves more. Uh, it's also a time we often are selfless, but it's also a time that's let's make a list of what we want. And we give it to people, say, here's my list, because... We could get more excited about making things about us during this time of year than we can at other times. So there's a great temptation there <clears throat> to do that. So we need to be careful that the direction of our devotion isn't ourselves. I want to talk about a uh, motivation for our actions because <clears throat> Herod did some great things. He was known as Herod the Great. There's a lot of Herods throughout the Bible and it gets confusing, but uh his religion and politics were, were many, but they were really all designed to, 
to be something <clears throat> to make him great, to make him look good. He did things like create all these amazing aqueduct systems. He rebuilt the temple for the Jews, uh, Solomon's temple, Solomon's portico. He added on. He did some things like that. He also built some pagan uh, buildings for the Romans. He basically did whatever somebody wanted him to do in certain circumstances if it made him look good. He was kind of like the stereotypical, the stepdad trying to earn favor with the kids and doing whatever it takes to kind of earn or buy their affections. And so <clears throat> that was kind of what Herod was doing. But here's the thing. So our motivation behind our actions will either drain us or give us life when things get difficult. Because life's going to get difficult and we have to work. We have to we have to keep moving forward in times in and our motivation behind the things that we do, behind the work that we do, behind the lives that we live will either drain us or give us life. I remember uh, being neighbors with Gio and Jolyn Richards, and they were part of our church family for many, many years and just recently moved not too long ago. But I, I got the privilege of getting to observe, observe Gio and Jolyn um, parent Geo would get up in the morning, would spend time with the Lord, uh, read his Bible. He exercised regularly because he wanted to have more energy to do the things that he felt God called him to do. When he went to work, he was a man of great character. People thought highly of him, and he would get home from work, and I would watch him, though he might be tired, spend time with his kids, doing things with them, because he knew it was important for him to be, uh, to be present, to not be an absent father. And he lived this way because he wanted to ultimately honor God. His motives for his actions, for doing all these things, is he wanted to honor God with the one life that he had and the responsibilities that God gave him in this one life. And so we need to recognize that God has given us responsibilities. And, and Herod did a bunch of wonderful things, but his motives the whole time was himself wasn't caring for others. It was totally himself. And everything that threatened it created anxiety and stress in his life until it drove him mad. And we need to be careful to check the motivations for the actions that we do. Even if it's going to church or living life, going to work, whatever it is. And then there's the display of our affections. Um, for Herod, it's, it's the opposite of what love should be. Uh, Herod Herod the Great goes down in history as one of the evil, murderous, self-absorbed people that caused others pain. The whole time, his intentions were to be so liked by others that it produced the opposite results. Herod the Great becomes a footnote in the history of a baby king, the king of the Jews, that at the time had not done anything but is more deserving of worship. The wise men recognized his worth. Uh, just to recap a few things, um, when it comes to showing love, we can see that if King Herod, the direction of his devotion was so inward focused, motivation for his actions were so that other people, just to please people, and the display of his affection, uh, that is to say he went down in history as not someone who is perceived as loving and it doesn't matter what you say people will remember the things that we do uh, even this week i was reading this wonderful gospel quote and i thought oh this is a good quote about um, legalism versus accepting the gospel accepting the gift of love and it was by someone who i didn't know and when i did a little research on this particular it was a pastor I discovered the pastor had two uh, extramarital affairs in his life and uh, it turned out like, all right, I don't want to use this quote, even if the words are great. When I look at the guy's life, do you really want that to represent? Uh, do you really want to throw that quote on the screen and use it? People have a tendency to remember what we do more than what we say. And even what they uh, perceive to be loving or not loving. Um, I think of the song by Casting Crowns called House of Their Dreams 
where it paints a picture of a Christian family that had good intentions and and the husband is starting out, you know, working for the family and the wife is exercising, but the motives begin to to shift to where she's trying to be enough for her husband. Uh, he's trying to uh, get enough to, to build more stuff. Uh, and it's this course is like they're trapped in their own world and their own with their own wars, with their cell phone and their closed doors. And it, it's a great picture of how they're all alone together in this house of their dreams that they think that they have what they want, but they let their motivations slip and their displays of affections, even towards each other shift. And there's, uh, they're not even perceived anymore as loving. And uh, it is important to remember uh, the direction and the motivation and the display that God gave us in Jesus Christ so that we would know how to love in these areas. Uh, because the direction of Jesus' love was to honor the Father. The motivation was that he would glorify God, and the display of his affection was done on the cross for us so that we could have life. And if you look at 1 John chapter 4, it gives us a great picture of what love should look like. 1 John chapter 4, starting at verse 7, says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So pause for just a minute. What does it mean that God is love? Well, there are four different Greek words for love throughout the Bible. Uh, eros, which is a romantic love, and phila, which is where we get Philadelphia. It's a brotherly love. Storge, which is an unconditional uh, love, like a family love. And then there is agape, which is the word used here, uh, that there is uh, a universal, the sense that, that God is love. God is the manifestation of this characteristic that we should have, this benevolent uh, characteristic uh, towards others. It says this, uh, verse 9, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So just as Andrea said in the children's segment, man, the reason we know what love is, is because we recognize that God first loved us. When he came to this earth, was born, lived the perfect life, died on the cross for our sins, it gave us a picture of this characteristic, of this attribute of God. It's this example that because Jesus's the direction of his love was that to obey the Father, and the motivation of his actions were to glorify God, therefore, because God is love, we can see evidence of, of God's love. And when people accept this gift, it makes such a difference in people's lives. I mean, you can see people who have, there are some people that just get bitter in life, they're beat down, and there's other people that can go through the same circumstances and come out uh, better and loving, forgiving. And it all has to do with how people have responded to this gift of love. Because people who have placed their faith in Christ have a higher uh, propensity to be able to uh, to love others well. And we want to be a people that love God and love others well. And we can only do that through this great gift of love that's been given to us because of Christmas, because of the cross. So, Heavenly Father, I pray that we'd be a church that could be loving. God, we're not a perfect church, but we serve a perfect God. And I pray that you would help us to love God and love others well during this season of chaos, during this season of trouble. God, we look to you. And we thank you for your grace and your goodness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.